Hi, I'm Selby Drummond. Welcome back for tonight's live Google Plus Hangout for the Ovation Original Series, The Fashion Fund. I'm joined tonight by Monique Payan. Hi, I'm Monique. Greg Chait of The Elder Statesman. Hey, it's Greg. And Mark Allery. Hi, I'm, Mom, I'm Mark. Hi, guys. Hi, Mark. Thanks for, for joining me tonight. Um, Monique, I want to start with you because I'm glad to have you here in a chair where you can't escape to answer this question. Your jewelry allegedly contains uh, materials like meteorite that comes from outer space, fossilized woolly mammoth, dinosaur bone. So riddle me this, Monique Payon, where on earth do you find this material and is it really eco? I know eco is a big part of your business, so tell me how it's eco. Sure. Um, well, for starters, I wanted to be an astronaut when I was young. It didn't work out, so I figured might as well incorporate the materials from outer space into my collection. Um, but I'm really focused on sustainability. When I learned more about the jewelry industry and how detrimental mining is for the environment, I really wanted to incorporate um, an eco-friendly practice eco-friendly practices into my collections and so um, I'm always looking for new sustainable materials to work with. Our fossilized woolly mammoth and fossilized walrus ivory comes from the Arctic Circle and um, as you mentioned the meteorites come from outer space and I work with artisans all over the world to find new fair trade um, and sustainable materials to work with. Yeah, well, I know that's not at the bead store. The bead store I go to does not have meteorite <laughs> in it. Do you have, will you show, do you have rings on? I do. Can you see them? Yeah. So a um, little bit of dinosaur bone that's from the Jurassic period, 150 million years old. Um, fossilized walrus tusk uh, that has been colored by minerals over 35,000 years. Um, a slice of sapphire and then an antique diamond from the late 1800s. And then some fossilized woolly mammoth that's about yeah. 40,000 years old. So just like the regular stuff. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, Greg, your the elder statesman cashmere is like cashmere. It, it's like the fine jewelry I always think of of fabric, and it's like when you for anyone who's never touched it, it's it feels like it's spun in heaven and woven on the thighs of virgins, and it's just <laughs> it, <laughs> from another world. But you seem like a really kind of laid back, low maintenance, happy California guy. Are there incredible places that this journey of luxury cashmere has taken you? Like, what's a crazy project that you've worked on? Crazy project. Uh, actually, recently we just wrapped a project at my friend's place in Switzerland, and they had this wild idea to wrap a room entirely in cashmere, floor, ceiling, walls. I mean, the whole darn room in it. It actually really worked out quite well, but it's... It was pretty incredible. They did the whole thing, and I'm actually going to go visit them pretty soon. So that was pretty. That was pretty wild. We've done some other strange stuff, but um, that one, the most recent one, top of mind. Well, I, I that's like my. I have a room like that in my house. Oh no, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> um, but Greg, you're that's sort of how I think about I, what you make. You obviously make clothes, and when you do the fashion fund, it's about fashion, but it's also about a lifestyle for you. And what is the lifestyle? It, I, for your fashion fund, for your fashion week presentation this past week, you did a porta potty. You designed a whole. <laughs> no, no, that was a. That's actually pretty funny. No, I worked with. Um, you know, everything that uh, you know I do is is, is first person. You know, so um, I had this interesting idea, and I met these great kids here in Los Angeles called the Haas Brothers. Um, it's an amazing artist duo. And I reached out to him. I said, look, man, I really want to get your interpretation. I want to see my work through your eyes. And um, I had them do an installation uh, for me in a space in New York. And it was just pretty awesome. They did these crazy latex dolls. And they were on a conveyor belt system and going the whole time. And there were, like, our models and a sweater punching machine. And there was humor, but there was, you know, but they're serious about what they're doing. I really, kind of, I really loved it. And they love fashion. But they, you know, they're not in fashion, so their take was so interesting for me. Um, so that was pretty cool. And Mark, you ha you use a lot of humor in your pieces. We get to see on the episode some of your monkey pieces. Do you have something you can show us here now? I can yeah. see your little monkey pendant, but I feel like well, I got I got this one that I wear all the time, of course. And uh, I have like this rain tonight. I don't know if you see. Yeah, yeah, you can yeah. See like that. 
monkey moving gets you like like behind the shank right there. Yeah. And so how uh, did you start working? How did you start working with animals? What's your inspiration? You obviously spent a lot of time at the zoo. Um, I did actually. I did like uh, I come from France, so basically the wildlife is kind of like limited. All I saw is kind of like cows and uh, some dogs and uh, not much. So I did actually like spend some time at the zoo, but mainly my mum had this like collection of like magazine of uh, wild wildlife and. Uh, I think like she was passionate definitely about like uh, with uh, with animal panthers and um, I think that she passed it on to me so and it's kind of like the first collection was some kind of tribute to her anyway so um, that's that's it yeah. Um, that's a that's a very touching story. How do you have you been watching the show? Have you how do you feel um, about the way you've been portrayed on the show? Because there's a beautiful scene of you crying. There's a be it, it's very emotional. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, oh, okay. Well, I haven't seen much of it because um, I don't own a TV. So um, no, I, I, I've seen it a bit. I was a bit scared about it because uh, you know, like the, the way I would come up. I, I did see a few things, and uh, it's like kind of shocking. Like I, I'm really neurotic. I think. Like so, I thought I was kind of like the easy guy. Like really, you know. Like kind of like you would imagine Greg. I imagine myself a bit like Greg. You know, like cool. <laughs> I'm not, obviously, like really always talking, so that was a bit weird. All right, That's well, the only it, thing I saw. All right, well, it, I think it ends up quite nicely, and we get to see in a later episode your acceptance speech, because you do, I hate to ruin it, but <laughs> you can also Google this. <laughs> um, yeah. I, you end up winning runner-up, which is a great, you know, one of the the goals, um, and your acceptance speech is really touching. Also, do you remember what it was like to get up in front of that room of hundreds of people and talk, you know, accept the award? No, I have like no memory of it. Like uh, actually, someone from uh, WWD sent it to me. Um, like they they recorded it and sent it to me the next day, which was really nice and touching. Um, but I, I um, until then I, I really didn't remember anything. I just like spoke from the heart, I guess. And uh, I was just like really thrilled to be in the room with with everyone. It was just like really a, an amazing moment. Um, so, like I, I I remember like everyone told me afterwards like oh my god you blew up Tom Ford because you know there was like um, Julian Moore right next to me and I, I was a huge fan of Julian Moore. So um, yeah, I think that's kind of like the first thing that like. That I said it was like, oh my god, I can't believe I'm on stage with Julian Moore. Very excited about it, and uh, and uh, and then I, I just said um, whatever was in my head. I, I don't remember much. I said I, I said a lot. Like I'm very happy, and I love what I do a lot. I think, which is true. I love what I do, um, and forgot to say thank you to a lot of people. But um, yeah, that was a magical moment. Greg, what about you? When you you actually won the previous year, um, do you remember what you said? Did you have a speech planned, like in true LA fashion, an Oscar acceptance speech planned, or did you just speak from the heart? I just spoke from the heart. I didn't really have anything planned, but um, you know, truth. I got some good advice from a buddy before I went in. Like a good friend called me right before and said, just like take a lot, take a deep breath, take it all in, be a part of the room. So when they did call my name, I it's kind of really present at the time, so I felt pretty good when I went up there. I don't really remember what I said per se. I just remember the award itself being uber, like super heavy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that, thing, that thing's super heavy, and uh, like, nothing like a cashmere blanket. <laughs> yeah, no. Um, but it felt really good, you know. You know, my company is named after my late brother, so it was a really good moment that I got to honor him, and so I, I, it was really nice. Laura was in the audience and it was her birthday that night. It was just it was just a really fun night. I really I mean couldn't have gotten better really. And how did you did you start off thinking, did you like sit with your high school career counselor and say, I want to make floor to ceiling cashmere rooms in the side of a mountain in the Alps? Or like how did you wind up working in fashion? Gosh, um no if it was up to my high school counselor, I think I'd like you know, she would have just let me drop out. <laughs> just, you know, where, I, you know, <laughs> um, actually, my mom gave her a hard time. I remember. Um, but no, I, I ended up working in fashion. I was in the music industry. Uh, I thought I wanted to be in the music industry, and I worked briefly in it. I actually did my first internship when I was 18 with Whitney Houston. Believe it or not, that was like my first job ever. Um, 
and then uh, came to LA. I lived in Australia for a bit. Came to LA, and I thought I wanted to be in music. And after working in music for maybe, you know, in the in a mail room at one of these big uh, agencies, I realized quickly that I'd rather just be a fan. I love, you know, I love music too much. You know, um, work can work can do that to a passion. Yeah, yeah, and it wasn't, you know, I wasn't a musician per se. You know, um, so I didn't want to work in the business of it, and uh, so I, at the same time while I was working at this particular company, um, they had a brands division, and we did. It was like the kind of the first time that brands and fashion and uh, were kind of, believe it or not, and celebrities were kind of mixed together. There were still, you know, lots of fashion models in the cover of magazines at the time. So, you know, we had lots of big clients at this place that we worked at. So, what's that? I was the olden days. Models Man. on the cover of magazines. You don't yeah, see it was that crazy. <laughs> but there was a brand division, so we actually learned. I mean, I I went into the brand side of things, so I learned how. To, I mean, I got to work with amazing people like Richard Branson, and, you know, a bunch of other crazy people in that division. And then at the same time, I was doing my friends from Australia that I met brought this this a suitcase of this stuff to my house called Subi. I don't know if you guys remember Subi, the denim oh, company yeah. from Australia. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah, so I actually launched that in North America out of my living room at night while I was doing this, and then that kind of took off. I learned a little bit about it and um, a little bit of you know about the industry. And at the same time, I was growing this crazy cashmere blanket collection, believe it or not. And um, I really just inherently loved this fiber, and I was searching for the perfect cashmere blanket. And then I found these people up in um, the Pacific Northwest that hand spun yarn and did knitting and with that one swatch, like six by six inch swatch, I, just in that one making, being part of that one process, like it was like one of those crazy eureka the rest moments. Is history. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So sorry, it's kind of a long story, but yeah. <laughs> um, but, Music yeah. to jeans to, to cashmere. But Monique, you had a similar, I know you didn't start off studying fashion, so how did you come about to your dinosaur bones? <laughs> um. Similarly to Greg, it's a little bit of a convoluted story, but I um, started my career in finance. I worked at Goldman Sachs and sold derivatives before the whole market fell apart. Obviously. Um, and unfortunately, my little sister passed away in a car accident, and it just completely changed my life. Um, she was 16 at the time, and I just thought to myself, I don't know if my life is going to be another six months or another 60 years, but I know that from this moment going forward, I need to get up every day and do something that I love and something that makes a little bit of a difference. Um, so I started a foundation entitled the Vanessa Pam Foundation in her memory and started making jewelry. So I just found it very therapeutic to work with my hands and have always loved all mediums of art. My mother's an artist. And, and now, almost eight years later, um, I found myself here and it was just amazing to go through the fashion fund and receive the support of Vogue and Anna and all of the amazing people at the CFDA and it's incredible to see what the Fashion Fund has done for so many young designers um, over the last 10 years. Um, Mark, if you were not, I love hearing Greg and Monique's story, if you were not making jewelry, what do you think your other life would be? What would you be doing? <sighs> I don't, um, I don't know. Like, I actually like the funny thing is I did. I didn't start into um, fashion as well. I um, I was a graphic designer. I actually worked in the music industry for a while before I did. I did illustration. I did like some people say I did like ten thousand kind of like different um, work. Uh, but if I had to pick, um, I don't think it's like really real. It's not really a work. I, I mean, I would travel and surf. That's all I would do. I guess. <laughs> Um, I feel like that's what Greg and Monique do. I feel like Greg surfs and Monique travels, and they, yeah. they, they make their business out of that. There's no, a lot of hard work that goes into it, too, but that's the beauty of running your own business. Mm -hmm. You decide where you get your inspiration from. Yeah. But All it's right. funny like to be paired with uh, both of them. Like It's really funny. Like Greg and I like talk about surf, like Monique and I. Obviously, I've got a like, deep passion for jewelry. So I mean, it's like, kind of like perfect Google Hangout, I guess. <laughs> Good. Well, we can continue to hang out more on Google Plus or it, in in our real lives as well later on. <laughs> but thank you all for joining me this evening, um, and to everyone who's watching at home, we hope you will join us again next week. Next week, actually, our live Google Hangout will be at 11 p.m. 
following the season finale of the Ovation original series, The Fashion Fund, which will air at 10 o'clock. So come back here at 11 o'clock next week um, to, to wrap up the whole thing. So thanks, every, thanks very much. Have a good night.